Come on, let's put our hands together for Jesus in this place one more time. Awesome. I love to hear from Pastor Chris and surgery on Tuesday went well. He's home with Brandy and his family and he's recovering. Just keep praying for him. Keep him in your prayers that he will come back stronger and healthier than he's been in 25 years. That's a prayer for our pastor and, and we're going to see him soon enough again. All right. Hey, I'm on a, a little high today because we just came out on our freedom conference this week. Oh, come on. We have some freedom people in the house today. Man, if you were not there, you missed out. But hey, we do this twice a year. Make sure you talk to someone in a blue shirt today and ask them, how can I get a blue shirt and be a part of that? It's amazing what God is doing in a church family. And before we go into the words today, I want to give you a quick update too. I don't know how often you're driving west on 1431 Whitestone. But if you haven't been for a while, let me show you a picture of what's happening on our property right now. Look at that, my friend. If you don't know what you're looking at, you're looking at the, the new church building that we're building right now. We have a builder there six days a week preparing the ground. You can see now the outline of the new church building. It's going to be amazing. So let me just say to all of you that committed in our All In Generosity initiative, all of you that have been starting standing in faith to give above and beyond your normal tithes and giving into this project Thank you so much. The miracle is happening right now. We're doing this for the one, and we're doing it for the one that don't know Jesus yet. And what you're watching here on the screen is a new miracle place. This is where Jesus will be known, loved, obeyed, and followed in that space right there. So let me give an update. All of you that committed, all of you that stood in faith, of the total commitment that were given in December when people said, I believe this is what we're going to do. What we've seen so far, we've seen 13.7% already funded all what was coming. Come on, can we just thank Jesus? And again, thank you. If you're one of the people that, that said, stood in faith and said, we're committing this in my family and starting that faith journey, sowing in, thank you so much. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, if you're new to the church, hey, welcome on board. This is something we did last fall. But it's not too late for you to join as well. You can scan this QR code. Look at that. Like on time. Uh, and, and you can hear more about the miracle that is taking place right now. Uh, we are going to reach more people for Jesus than ever before. All right. Are you ready for the word of God now? All right. We are in a series called the favor of God. The favor of God is tangible and it's practical. And today I have the honor to talk about maybe the most important piece to the favor of God. But before we go in and open the Bible, if you have a Bible, let's just lift it up in the air. If you don't have a Bible, if you read the word on your screen, on your device, lift it up. Or just lift your hand up. Let's lift something up. We do this every Sunday. And let's just declare together. Everyone say this, Father God. Thank you for your word. Your word is a lamp to my feet, is a light to my path. Your word changes me from the inside out. And today I'm ready to receive. I'm willing to obey your holy word. Amen. All right, we're going to jump into text today. In, in John's Gospel chapter 14, which takes place the night before Jesus gives his life on the cross. So this is his last night with his disciples. He's already told them that he's going to leave them. He's taking off. He's going he's gonna to give his life. And they are a little bit worried. They've been with him now for three and a half years. And he said, you don't have to worry because greater things are yet to come. And he says this in, in John 14 verse 16. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. The word helper, comforter, encourager, counselor who will never leave you. So I may be believing you right now but the next one coming, taking my place, another helper will never leave you. And it's a gift from my Father. Now, before we move on, I want you to understand that we serve a good 
good God. God is nothing but good, my friend. So when God is giving a gift, it's always a good gift. No matter what we think, no matter how we reason, if God says, I'm going to give you something, you and I better just say yes. And trust that what He's giving is going to be good for us, no matter what we think or feel or understand. So when God says, I want to give you, yes, I receive it. Oh, you don't even know what it is yet. It doesn't matter. God, I trust you. Well, I want to bestow unto you. Yes, I take it. That's our attitude, right? So now Jesus said He will give you another helper, a counselor, comfort, encourager. He is the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Father is the Holy Spirit. And this sentence here is really critical, very important. Because some Christians have a hard time wrapping their mind around who is the Holy Spirit. And, and we think sometimes of Him as a force or an it. We can think of what well, God the Father I, I can grasp. And, and Jesus, He was a human. He lived here on earth. I can picture Him. But the Holy Spirit, ooh, right? Well, it says He is the Holy Spirit. He is a person. Do you know the, the New Testament language is Old Greek? Do you know what he means in Greek? He. It's not complicated. He is a person who leads you into all truth. Now the world cannot receive him because it's not looking for him and doesn't recognize him. The world would try to reason and try to figure things out. But now that's not how you find him. You know him and the disciples are like how can I know him if I never met him well because he lives with you Jesus said we're going to get back to that in a minute what did Jesus mean by that and then later he will be in you all right the gift of God is the Holy Spirit that will release all the favor of God and all the promises God has for you and now. Now, sometimes as I mentioned, how, how we can have a relationship with the Holy Spirit is a stumbling block for some believers. It, it's hard to picture what that will look like. But today, I've been praying for you. That it will make sense to you. That it will click. A revelation will, will, will reach you. And your heart will just have that desire and, and, and fuel that fire to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because guess what? It's already in your heart. Now when Jesus says, we're going to take it from, from the end and to the beginning. He says, He will live in you. Well, that sounds weird. What do you mean the Holy Spirit living in me? And why later? He will later. Why not now? Why not before? Why, why later? What is going on here? Well, let us take this from the beginning. When I say that your heart is longing already for the Holy Spirit, it's because number one, you are created for God's Spirit on your inside. The thought that Jesus is saying that the Spirit will live in you is not a new thought. It has been God's plan from the very beginning. When God creates humanity, it's described like this in the first book in the Bible. The second chapter says in verse 7, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. And he, listen now, breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils. The Old Testament, which this is, is written in Hebrew. And in Hebrew, the word wind, breath, and spirit are interchangeable. It's the same word, ruach, in, in Hebrew. So when, the, when it says that God was breathing His breath, His breath, God's breath, His wind, His spirit into the nostrils of the man. And what was the result? He, the man, became. He found an identity and he became a living person. He became alive. He had now God's life on the inside. My friend, you and I are created to carry God's Spirit on our inside, in our hearts, to be temples of God's Spirit. That's who we've been created to be. Now, when you continue your biblical history in the next chapter, in chapter 3, is when Adam and Eve decided and chose to, to pick sin instead of God and to turn their backs against God. And when they did so, the disconnect from God happened. They were losing the life of God on the inside. The, the, the Bible talks about this as being spiritually dead. 
The definition of spiritual dead is when we live here on earth and we're walking around even in this day, today alive on the earth. But without God's spirit in our hearts, we are spiritually dead. We are disconnected from God. Adam and Eve lost that in the fall of man. So for the rest of the Old Testament, the people are looking for God. They are seeking God. They are creating rules around how to worship God. And they are longing for more of God. But never again can they experience the closeness of God with Him living in their hearts. The disconnect was there and sin was standing in the way. You see, God is holy. He's called the Holy Spirit. And He will not and He cannot share that space with something that is impure like sin. And this is the reason now, even to this day, that no matter who you are, no matter who you become, no matter the amount of success and experiences in your life and you're seeking the next success and the next million dollars and the next high in life in different areas, if I can just do this, then my emptiness will be filled. And maybe it will in, for a little bit and that high may last for, for a minute, but guess what? It will still be empty. There will still be a thirst. There will still be a void there. A place that only God can fill because that's how we are created. Now for the rest of the Old Testament we will find stories where it says now and then that the Spirit of God will come upon people. Never again on the inside in them, but it will come upon them. The Spirit of God came upon Moses and Elisha and King David and, and Gideon and Samson and so many other stories. You read that sentence, the Spirit of the Lord came upon this person. And the Spirit of God will come upon them with special power for a special assignment for an elect few people that had a special mission for God. And we read these stories in the Old Testament and we think, wow. That's cool. They were moving, operating under the power and the influence of God. And, and surely they are part of, of the, the hall of faith now in Hebrews chapter 11. But the end of chapter 11 says that even though they were faith people, they never received what God had promised for us. Because you see the power of God came upon them. And, and, and just a quick side note, two weeks from today we celebrate what the global church calendar will call Pentecost Sunday. And Pentecost Sunday, my friend, is the, the moment in church history, in the Bible, in the book of Acts, when the Spirit of God will not just come upon a few elect anymore, but the Spirit of God could come now upon anyone who belongs to Jesus. For Him to empower us, for Him to send us out on a special mission for Him. And we can be empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit too when the Spirit comes upon us now. I will not lean in more on that. We're going to talk more about that in two weeks, even though I'm tempted to talk about it right now. I have to talk myself out of it. But even though the Spirit of God was upon some people, like King David, arguably maybe the person in the Old Testament closest to God, yet they were missing something in their hearts. This is what King David is expressing in Psalm 42 verse 1. He says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. I'm a king, I'm leading your nation, I'm following your decrees, I'm worshiping you, but I'm thirsty for more. There was always that thirst in their hearts for more because the problem of sin had not been dealt with yet. Now good news, fast forward. God became man. He was made flesh. His name was Jesus. God loved this world so much that He sent His only Son. And that is the story of the New Testament now that Jesus walked the earth and Jesus said Himself, I come to seek and to save those who are lost. Who is He talking about? He's talking about us. I was lost. I was spiritually dead and Jesus came to seek us, not to see if we are good enough, if we earned His love, if we deserve His forgiveness. No, He came to seek and then to save, to rescue us. How did Jesus rescue us? Well, we already mentioned it. He took His perfect life and He was nailed to a cross. Not because He done anything wrong, but because I had and you had and He took our punishment. My sin, my mistake, my shame, my guilt, and yours too. And he paid the price for that on Calvary when he was nailed to the cross. And because of him paying the price, 
now we can be forgiven. Not because I earned it or deserved it, but because he's good and he's loving and he's kind and he proved his love to you and I. While he died for us when we were still sinners. And because of that now, not because I am perfect in myself, but because I stepped in to Jesus' perfection. That is what salvation is. He's forgiven me of my sin. Now we can be forgiven. And now the Holy Spirit can move back into our hearts. And we are now restoring creation. Stepping into God's original plan that he had from the beginning. Remember what Jesus said? He said, later he will live in you. When you read that, you may think, I wonder what later is it is. Is it in 400 years? Is it in four millennials? No, it was four days. Four days later, after he said this in John chapter 4, uh, sorry, 14, he died on the cross the following day. And then he spent three days and three nights in the grave. And then he he, he stood up again, resurrected King and Savior, conquered death and grave and sin for all times. Forgiveness is now released and now sin has been dealt with. And the very first thing that happens is that he, he visits his confused disciples again. They are terrified. They don't know what to believe. Someone said the grave is empty. They, they lean in and he's not there. And they're just locking themselves into a room. And they are panicking. They don't know what to do. And all of a sudden Jesus shows up. And Jesus said, the first thing Jesus says is, peace be with you. And I don't think it's a religious peace, but peace be with you. I think they were panicking. Ah, Like what's happening? And he said, chill. Shalom. Calm down. Peace. Time out. I don't know what he did, but he, he said all of that. And then the very first thing that happens, listen now church, the absolute first thing that happens is, is in John 20, 22. And it says this, now he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Do you recognize this? It's mirroring, it's a parallel to Genesis chapter 2. God is breathing the breath of life into Adam and he became alive. Now Jesus paying, paid for the sin. Now he's breathing on them. He said now again you can receive the spirit of life. You're no longer spiritually dead but now you're spiritually alive. Now you're connected to, to God again. Now the spirit can live on your inside and in this moment. The disciples, had, the disciples had the incredible honor of being the very first Christians. They were saved in this moment. What are you talking about? I thought they were hanging with Jesus for three years before. Yeah, they were hanging around him. They followed him. They obeyed him to the best of their capacity. And they, they loved him. But sin was still in their hearts because Jesus had not died on the cross yet. Now Jesus had died on the cross. He rose from the dead and now salvation was released. And they are now receiving salvation. And the Spirit is now moving back into their hearts. And that leads us to number two. The Holy Spirit within is the seal of your salvation. If you have said yes to Jesus... Then God has breathed the breath of life on you and you are now a temple of the Holy Spirit. Well, this is what Ephesians chapter 1 says in verse 13. When you believed in Christ, pause there. Not when you earned His love. Not when you did all the things right. Not when you fixed your life so that you could be a good church goer and finally you start to tithe, you fasting, you pray. No, 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 none of that. All you had to do when you believed. It's a gift freely given from Jesus. He loves you so much that He's given you life for free. And all we have to do is to believe that He's forgiven me. And when you believed in Him, you got saved. Then He put His seal on you. How? By giving you the Holy Spirit whom He promised long ago. The day you said yes to Jesus. The day you said, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. He puts His seal, His stamp on you. And He said, now you belong to me. You're my son. You're my daughter. You're no longer a citizen of this planet. But you are now a citizen of heaven. If we can look into the spiritual realm, if you said yes to Jesus, there is a bright shining seal on your heart. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to doubt your salvation. You belong because Jesus paid a price for you. 
That is the seal. And then it continues and says in the next verse, the spirit is God's deposit. <laughs> I like deposits when they're coming my way. My wife loves deposits when she, she's selling stuff on Facebook Marketplace. We were just talking about this the other day. A vase or a painting, whatever you sell on Facebook Marketplace. I have strangers by my door all the time picking stuff up. I don't know. What are you doing here? I'm here to pick up a vase. I'm like, okay, here it is. I don't know. You put stuff on Facebook Marketplace and another, I don't know where you place. But there's a haggling. There is a negotiation going on. But then one in the crowd will say, I really love this painting. And I'm willing to put down the deposit. I cannot pick it up until next week. But I'm going to put $50 in now. Can you, can you hold it for me? I promise I'm coming for it. And here's $50 deposit to hold it. And Stephanie would be like, yes, ma'am. It's yours. ka -ching. You know what I'm saying? Now it's sold. It's hers. It's a deposit. What is the deposit? Guaranteeing. That he will give us the inheritance as he promised. And that he has purchased us to be his own people. When doubt come your way, when condemnation is, is swinging you away from the enemy, you can say, devil, you have nothing on me. I belong to Jesus. And the devil says, well, Daniel, you're not perfect. And you did this and you said that. And you were thinking this evil thought. And I say, yes, but it's under the blood. Because Jesus paid the price. And I belong to heaven. I belong to his people. And here's the seal, the deposit. His name is the Holy Spirit promising Everything, all the favor God has given us, it's given through Him. We can receive it today. And He did this so that we would praise and glorify Him. Listen, we can become the people of praise. No matter what happens in your own life, no matter how hard days we're experiencing, we can lift our face and say, yeah, today is tough. Today is painful, but I live for eternity. I'm a citizen of heaven. My name is written in the book of life. I'm, I'm an alien in this planet. I belong to Jesus. In other words, the Holy Spirit on your inside gets you ready for heaven. It's a seal. Now, the Holy Spirit upon you that we're going to talk about in two weeks on Pentecost gets you ready, equips you with power for a life here on earth because we're not in heaven yet. We'll talk about that later. But for now, I want you to know the Holy Spirit, if you said yes to Jesus, is living in you. <laughs> You're carrying the person, the Holy Spirit with you all this time. And He's longing for a relationship with you. So what is that relationship supposed to look like? We're going to wrap up with this. Number three. Jesus said it in the beginning. He said the Holy Spirit is another helper. Another helper, counselor, encourager, comforter. Now in English, we have one word for another. And that word is another. But in Greek, Old Greek that this is written, they have two different words for another. And the two words are heteros and alos. Now, heteros means another of a different kind. So let me show you. If you are hungry, I brought you a banana. And I give you this banana and you are still hungry. And I would say, would you like another fruit? And I hand you an apple. If I would speak Greek, I would say, would you like a heteros fruit? And you would say, yes. But if I would give you a second banana and say, would you like another fruit? And I speak Greek, I would say, would you like an alos fruit? Another of the same kind. And this is important now, church. I've been praying that this will be a revelation that would help you lean in into your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because when Jesus is saying, I will pray to the Father and He will give you another helper. He's using the word alos. He will give you someone, another, but of the same kind. Listen now, church. Jesus has been the helper for the, the disciples for three and a half years. He's been leading them. He's been correcting them. He's been answering their questions. He's been holding their hands. He's been kicking their butt. He's been correcting. He's been filling them with faith. He's been encouraging. He's been taking them on faith adventure all over Israel. And now their word because he's leaving. So now he becomes their 
comforter. And he's comforting them. And he's saying, don't worry because the Father will give you an Allos helper. An Allos comforter. Someone that is just like me will take my place and you will not be left alone. And he will always be with you. But think even bigger because it's going to be greater because he will live in you. You will not be limited to geographical location anymore, Peter. But anywhere you go in the world, he will be with you. So in other words, so Peter heard, what James heard, what Mary heard, is that we are going to continue the same relationship that we have had with Jesus for three and a half years. And we're going to have the same kind of relationship with the Holy Spirit. Just like we've been talking to Jesus, asking questions around the bonfire. That is what we're going to do now with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, what do you think? Holy Spirit, what are you saying? Holy Spirit, where are we supposed to go? Holy Spirit, what do you want to do in this situation? Holy Spirit, can you help me? Can you comfort me? Can you instruct me? What is your relationship with the Holy Spirit supposed to look like? Just like Peter's relationship with Jesus. Just like Mary's relationship with Jesus. It is not complicated. It is not a mysterious force or a weird it. It's a person. And he is an Allah's helper. He stepped in in Jesus' place and said, let me take it from here. Religion has made it complicated, my friend. Religion has made it hard. And some of you have even been hurt by bad experiences. Some of you have have been shying away a little bit from the relationship of the Holy Spirit. Say, well, I, I, I love Jesus and I can worship Him and, and I get it, but I don't know about the Holy Spirit because I had a weird experience once and I don't think that's for me. Well, I believe God wants to bring healing today and help you lean in to this loving, life-giving relationship that you are created to have with the Holy Spirit. I want to share a story, a quick story with you to illustrate this. It says in Mark 9, as Jesus was coming down from a mountain with his disciples, they met a big crowd. And in this crowd was a man, a dad, who had a demon-possessed boy, a son. And they are desperate. And Jesus has compassion on this family because they are suffering. And he's asking the dad, how long has this been happening? And the dad says, since he was a little boy. And then it says something procurial. He says... The spirit often throws, the evil spirit often throws him into the fire and into water trying to kill him, harm him, hurt him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. Now I'm going to reveal the end to this story. Jesus had mercy on them. He set that little boy free. But it's interesting to me the words fire and water. Because for the rest of the, the crowd around that dad and around Jesus, fire and water were critical life-giving elements. For most of the people there, for all of them, fire meant warmth on a cold day or light on a dark night or a tool to cook my food or gather my family and friends around for fellowship. It's a positive, good thing. Water for most people meant what was washing me clean after a sweaty, dirty day. <laughs> Or was quenching my daily thirst. It was a good thing but not for this boy. The evil spirit had given him fire and water and turned it into bad experience. So he was shying away from it. It was harmful. He was afraid of it now. It was supposed to be life-giving. He took steps away because he's been hurt by evil. It's fascinating to me how something that was meant to be life-giving can become hurtful well, we are afraid. I grew up in Sweden. I lived here for over 10 years, been with Pastor Chris and, and this church. But I grew up in Sweden, and Sweden has over 100,000 lakes. Lakes everywhere, everywhere you go. We had, when I left my house when I was a kid, we could go to five different lakes, just to throw a uh, stone throw away. Like we, we just go. So that means that everywhere you live in Sweden, you, as a kid, you, you learn to ice skate in the winter, you become a good hockey player. And then you learn to swim in summer. So most Swedish kids can ice skate and swim when they can, they learn to talk. Like that's how we are raised, right? Because there's lakes everywhere. So most Swedish kids swim before they're four or five. I did not. Because my mom was afraid of water. She had a bad experience when she was six years old in the 60s. And she got traumatized because she got stuck underwater and almost drowned. 
So from that day, no one helped her work through this trauma and this fear. So she lived with it. And when she had my siblings and myself, she was depositing the same fear into our lives. Her bad experience became fear in our life. And when all the other kids learned to swim, we heard our mom stand at the, the shore of the lake. And she would tell us, don't go too far. Don't put your head under the water. Oh, make sure you come back here. Stop splashing around. It's dangerous. Be careful. And we were terrified. Oh my gosh. This water is going to eat me alive. So when all the other kids could swim, we could not. So when we started elementary school a few years later, we had to be sent to swim school because Swedish kids have to learn. To, we're Vikings. We have to learn how to swim. <laughs> so they helped us. And, and they helped us to swim. And, and I have no fear we overcame that as kids. But my mom never overcame it. And that fear stopped her from something that was supposed to be life-giving. And she thought it was harmful and hurtful. Now, this boy was afraid of fire and water. They were dangerous to him. Fire and water happens to be the two strongest and clearest pictures in the New Testament that Jesus himself is using when he's introducing the Holy Spirit to us. When he's describing when the Holy Spirit will come upon you with his power it will be like you will be baptized with fire as a good thing you will be on fire for God you're going to be a living torch for him it will be explosive power and you can take the nations for him supernatural power in your life when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit and he was in charging his disciples with it it was a good thing and then he talks about the Holy Spirit on the inside in John 4 and John 7. And he said, when the Holy Spirit lives on your inside, it would be like rivers of living water. You will never be thirsty again. A positive thing. But the evil spirit had made fire and water something dangerous for this little boy. So he was afraid of the good Holy Spirit. And I'm saying all of that because maybe that's your experience. Maybe you have a stiff arm against out towards the Holy Spirit and said, I don't know. I don't know about the Holy Spirit. I had a bad experience. Someone taught me something, bad doctrine, religion, bad church experience where something became harmful instead of life giving. I'm here to tell you today that Holy Spirit wants to heal you. Just like he set this little boy free, he can set you free from that experience today. He can heal you because he wants to be your best friend. He wants to become your life-giving spirit, your comforter, your healer, your encourager, your helper. He does not want you to live life alone, but religion and evil spirit wants you to shy away from him. Because they know when you get hold of a relationship with the Holy Spirit, you're going to become unstoppable. So we better scare them a little bit more. Better scare them a little bit more. But I'm here to tell you today. I am sorry for what you had to walk through. I'm sorry for that bad experience. And I'm sorry that I made you walk further away from the Holy Spirit when you needed Him the most. And that harm, that bad experience was not God. It was not the Holy Spirit. Even if it was done in His, His name. God wants more for you. He wants healing from you. He wants us to trust Him and open our hearts and say, okay, I'm willing to try this. Holy Spirit, I want to learn to hear your voice. I want to drink of that water that you are talking about. I want to lean in. I want you to be my healer, my comforter, my helper, my encourager. I invite you, Holy Spirit, because when we do, healing will take place. And he will become your best friend. And when he becomes your best friend and you follow his steps, you will be unstoppable. Do you believe that? Let's put our hands together and thank God for the gift of the Holy Spirit today.